Welcome to the Companion Chapel Everyday Bible Study Broadcast. My name is Mike, coming to you from the Great Lakes area of beautiful Ontario, Canada, on this gorgeous. It is Monday, December 12th, 2022, and that makes it Tammy's birthday. So if you're a fan of Tammy, it's happy birthday, Tammy. December 12th, 2022, coming right up. It is the Book of Revelation. We're going to just cruise through this book. It is more relevant every time that I teach this book. It becomes more relevant, so I have to go over it again so that we can see how it's lining up with what's happening on the earth today, what's happening, what these people are doing. God told us all things our Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24. Hey, I've, I've told you everything, you guys. I've told you everything in this book of instructions that we are to get we are to get a working knowledge of before we leave earth. Now, please first consider your part in the many-membered body of Christ. The Companion Chapel is a registered nonprofit ministry. And this broadcasts or podcasts are only possible through your provisions i want to thank you very much for people that have donated so far i got insulation in here which is just great because i've done hundreds of podcasts freezing cold and now insulation and we've got a wood burning stove there and this is just awesome let's do this revelation chapter three now remember that we go over seven churches here and god's trademark stamp of validity also lies in biblical numerics. Seven means spiritual completeness. These seven churches, only two pass. The Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia. And now for the deeper student, the Church of Smyrna, that should get you thinking about the parable of the fig tree and those two figs. Well, we're not teaching that today. Philadelphia means brotherly love. And two churches pass. Philadelphia and Smyrna. The other churches, these churches cover every Thing on planet earth every religion every church possible falls into one of these seven churches so make sure where your assembly is and what you worship falls within the Lord Jesus Christ now let's let the Bible speak for itself open her up to chapter 3 of the book of Revelation and unto the angel messenger of the church in Sardis write write this down these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God Stop, seven spirits of God, Isaiah chapter, I forget, 11. The Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, that's what? The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of strength, and the spirit of reverence, those things belong to God. That's why wisdom, when it's written, Chukmol in Proverbs chapter 8, is feminine. All the verbs leading up to it are masculine. It's feminine, it's something God possesses. He's looking for a virgin bride. It thinks he possesses us. He wants his children back. Now, I'll just comment on the Holy Spirit here. Now, first remember, your spirit is an energy and your soul is an energy. Your soul is your life force and God allowed it. God owns all souls as it's written in the book of Jeremiah or Ezekiel, I forget, one of those two. They combine to form your identity. Your soul is what you are. You're a human being. You're a person. Your spirit is who you are. That's your reactive attitude that motivates all your actions. That's your personality, your character. That is the intellect of your soul. Now, when God says Holy Spirit, let's talk about, let's always use true science, not pseudoscience, Hollywood science, Netflix science, or true science, okay? Science will never rewrite the Bible. The Bible always just confirms true science. The universe is made out of energy. Our soul is an energy. Our spirit is an energy. We're an energy. We're locked in this flesh body right now for a reason. It's God's plans, plots, purposes to get rid of the world of evil. And we carry it. We're the one-third that fell. We have to come to terms with what is inside of us that is not conducive to a place of peace beyond our present comprehension. So the universe is made of energy. It is not made of ma matter. You look up in the sky at night or in whenever, if it's a clear day. It's not, it's not made of matter. It's made of energy. Quantum physics scientists call this energy the field. Their definition of the field is invisible moving forces beyond our current understanding and perception of physics. Anybody can see that. The field of energy has the influential authoritative power over matter, over the physical world. It keeps everything in its spot. Can't you see that? 
the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, which is His divine invisible force. Yeah, it's, right now it's beyond our current understanding and perception of physics, but we can see it. When people say, I can't see God, well, it's keeping you sitting down in this chair. It's keeping the, this planet in its place, doing its circle around the sun 24-7, 365 at the perfect distance for billions of years. It's keeping that our spot in the universe, in the zodiac, and we know. Psalms chapter, uh, I guess it's not my good memory day. Psalms chapter 19, I think. We know from, from the book of Psalms. Yeah, Psalms 19. That God's dwelling in circuits of time where he wants his children back to cohabitate with him. He's dwelling in the zodiac. He's there. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent. It's his energy. Okay, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, which is his divine invisible force beyond our current understanding and perception of physics. God's Holy Spirit is that invisible force that is only seen through his manifestations. Everybody can see it. Both seen externally to mankind and internally to the individual. Oh, you know. When you submit with an unquestioned obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will know. When you surrender your entire existence to Lord Jesus Christ, say, I, I surrender my entire existence to you willingly. Please cleanse me of everything that is offensive to you in your kingdom. That is of the darkness. That is corrupt to you in your kingdom. Cleanse me of these things, my Lord Jesus Christ. And please saturate me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that for all of you right now. Cover me in your veil. Wrap me in your vesture. Hold my hand, my Lord Jesus Christ. That's, we went over the Holy Spirit. And wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, strength, and reverence is a huge one. We can ask for the six other spirits to dwell within us, but the spirit of reverence belongs exclusively to God. Do not infringe upon that, and you'll know a fake pastor or preacher right away as soon as they call themselves reverent. The audacity. Standing there in a dress, even Jesus Christ said, well, you think these guys, you think a true preacher, you think a true prophet who's standing there in a dress? Wearing effeminate clothing? Jesus Christ said it. Now let's get back to chapter 3 here. Okay. He hath the seven spirits of God. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. His divine infinite power. The most powerful. And it all, all entails the truth. The truth is the most powerful force in the universe. Always remember that. Now I'm trying to read this here. So my pages are ripped. And... And the seven stars. Now we know what the stars are. Just go back a couple pages. The Bible contains its own glossary, Jehovah's Witness. When they keep telling me the stars are those twinkly things in the sky, well, these are in his hand. The stars get cast to earth. If one of those stars that we see in the sky at night gets cast to the earth, it's going to demo the planet. So what are you talking about? Stars don't sing for joy either. Job chapter 38. We all were once together singing for joy, exceeding joy. The seven stars of the angels. There's your glossary right there. It's not even a page back. Seven stars. Got the angels in his hand. I know thy works. He's talking to the church now. Wakey, wakey. Listen up. I know thy works. That thou hast a name and thou livest, yet thou art dead. Okay, I know who you are. You're spiritually dead. You're walking around right now. You're spiritually dead. I know your works. That's the most important thing that our Lord Jesus Christ talks about. Your works ends up being your Righteous acts, your that's what you wear. You works. Which it's not you standing there leaning up against leaning against a shovel all day on some construction site. Your works to make this a place of peace to get back to a place of peace beyond our present comprehension. Our works in this book, getting working knowledge. Okay, you're dead. He says you're spiritually dead. That's just what that means. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. That's our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Before Father, he's saying. This means you actively distort the truth. Perfect? Don't even think you're going to get close to there. Perfect means not fulfilling. Okay, your works aren't fulfilling to me. You guys are going through the motions. You guys are just going to church for social and cultural reasons. And let me tell you, oh, i got to be careful here, about accommodating people with sinful lifestyles. You accommodate everybody. We're all part of the many-member body. We know if they want to parade around and have sinful lifestyles. Because remember, morals 
is the benchmark for human values and virtue right off the first couple pages of your Bible. What happened in the garden? God expects morals. That's why adultery and idolatry are the, are the, are the same sin. Adultery is the moral sin. But it's the, same as I, it's the same as idolatry, the spiritual sin. You're not being faithful to God. If you're not being faithful to yourself or faithful to your um, wife or whatever situation you're in, then you're not being faithful to God either because you're living a lie. Now, what's it say here? Per, okay, so, oh yeah, accommodate people with sinful lifestyles. We accommodate them, but we don't accommodate... Your morally corrupt thought pattern. Keep that to yourself if you can't control yourself, if you can't, if you can't be meek. And meek means learn to say no to yourself in the face of all the vain curiosities, the lust of the flesh. Meek in the Hebrew is not mean submissive and easily imposed upon. It means the exact opposite. And we go over that quite a bit. To have self-discipline. Learn to say no to yourself. That's what meek means. It's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process that God demands of us. So don't impose your repulsive morals on others and expect us to embrace it. It's, it's, a, it's forbidden in the Bible. But they don't do that. God's not finding these people aren't fulfilling. Uh, they even put some uh, people that live sinful lifestyles behind the pulpit and give them authoritative roles. And... That means you, elders. You're hostile when the truth differs from your ideologies. A lot of times it's humanistic lifestyles. You know, based on their ideology of who they think God is, based on human merit, human endeavor, human experience, human entitlement. If you don't have a working knowledge of the Bible, it, listen to the preachers and elders. If you can't teach this to, the, to a child, then that means one thing. You don't understand it. It's time for you to search out for a remnant of truth because God promised us remnants of truth. And get reading the Bible. Don't be a commentary bandit. Like the Jehovah's Witness. They come out here and want to have a philosophical debate. I want to have an esoteric inside the Bible philosoph philosophical debate. They're exoteric. You know why? Because they're sitting there with their computers... And every time we're talking about a verse, they're reading a commentary. Get into the Word. Make sure your works are fulfilling. Don't actively distort the truth because of a catchphrase commentary. Remember that, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. What did you receive and heard? The salvation message. Hold fast to that. Now repent from being not fulfilling in your works. Let's go at Matthew 21. This is the greatest thing. The Bible always interprets itself. You can go to a, hundreds of thousands of commentaries, but when you have the Lord Jesus Christ, your teacher, your master, your rabbi, your wonderful counselor telling us, and I'll tell you what repent means. Here you go. Let's see. Now, don't forget who the scribes were. 1 Corinthians 2.55. The Kenites. We just went over that. You have to watch the Kenite thread to understand Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9. But Jesus Christ said, a certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. Yeah, put down that video game thing and get to work, boy. And this is God talking to all of us. Vineyard's the world. Field's the world. And this kid answered and said, I will not. No. He goes, no. No. Probably calls his mummy. No. But afterward, he repented and went. And he came to the second kid, who's sleeping until noon, and said likewise. And he answered and said, I'll go, sir. I'll go, dad. Yeah. And he didn't show up. He was a no-show for work. <laughs> okay, which two of these did the will of his father? Now, this, this isn't a trick, okay? Because in the English, that makes no sense at all. Because Jesus Christ goes on to say, neither of them. He says, Publics, publicans, publicans and harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you because you said the first one. No. Go into the manuscripts and understand this. And that's what Jesus Christ expects. And I'll do that for you all day long. Just help me out a little bit. Repent when it's the word meta meloname means grudgingly. 
If you if you go do something grudgingly, like feeling sorry with malice or having an aftercare or annoyance at the consequences of an act of the sin rather than a deep regret. I'm not going to do this anymore. It doesn't have power over me. My longings and wantings don't have power over me. So the kid didn't repent. He did it grudgingly. He had some malice. He had like, what's in it for me? And malice is a big deal in the Bible. Malice in the Bible, Jesus Christ had no malice, no corruption, no guile in him. Is this malice or is it guile? Feeling sorry with malice. Feeling sorry with guile. Feeling sorry with malice. It means not, you're not willing to do it. You're just doing it because of the consequences. Okay, and he came to the second kid said, likewise. If they would have said, repent, which is metanoia in the manuscripts, that means a real change of mind and attitude towards the sin itself. And that's what Jesus Christ expects of us. That's why he used that word in the Greek there, which wasn't translated properly into the English, but that's fine. I did it for you. So you understand Matthew 21, 29, 30, 31, 32. Isn't that just the greatest thing? What repent means is it's not grudgingly. You do it because you know, hey, this is the right thing to do. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come for thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. What's the thief come? Why is he using that analogy, our Lord Jesus Christ? Because they show up unexpectedly. You're not going to know. You're going to be sitting there in your overheated house, overfed, unconcerned, uh, being a pedestrian Christian, and we pray for those people. Get into the Word of God. So you can come out here and be a warrior for God. So you can be a servant of God. That's what he expects. God wants his children back. And we have to get this message out. So that's a great commission for us, for you, for me. Whatever God-given talents you have, God expects you to use it in the many-membered body of Christ. If you're good at managing, marketing, or if you're good at made, made lots of money, or whatever you can contribute, God expects it to be used in the many-membered body of Christ. What have I done? Well, I have 77 acres of land here. And anybody that wants to come and be part of the Companion Chapel homesteading community that wants to obey the divine laws of providence, these laws, these instructions written in the councils of eternity, can come here, put a trailer or a mobile home or whatever you want. You do the logistics, I supply the land, and we serve the Lord here. Okay off topic there now thou hast a few names even in Sardis which is not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy who are these people walking in white they haven't defiled their garments what's their garment the veil of Christ the veil of Christ the, the vesture the vesture of Christ the veil of Christ the vesture of Christ your garments they got to be in white okay that means clean and we're going to go over that like the word of God, God's word is clean. It's gold. Uh, don't present it dirty and polluted with human traditions and thought patterns all wound up in it. Won't, won't, won't allow that. We're talking about the promised remnant of truth here. You can find them. There's hardly any of them. The famine in the end times, according to Amos chapter 8, 11, is for hearing God's word taught properly, taught truthfully. That's the famine in the end times, and we're living it right now. And this book of Revelation is so much more relevant, even to when last year I taught it. More relevant in the here and now. You gotta stick with this whole series through the book of Revelation. It's the easiest book for me to teach. Easiest one. Because we can watch it playing out on planet Earth today. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I shall not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That's right. He's your mediator, he's your rep, he's your advocate. Our Lord Jesus Christ. It's God in proxy there for you. That's the way. That's the natural order of things that we read about right in the first verses of this book of Revelation, which means the unveiling, the revealing. Hey, I'm, 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 I put it in the name of the book, Lord Jesus Christ says. I'm unveiling to you what's going down. So don't get all freaked out by what the billionaires are doing on planet Earth. I told you in this book. I can't get off topic here. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Spirit, not mankind's commentary, not some crusty old elder, and not some $3 bill pastor who uses this Bible like a random book of quotes. Okay, you know right away when you're being taught the Bible, that's easy, this church is a fail. They failed. But God always gives us room to repent. 
That's a key word in the Bible. Let's go on to the church of Philadelphia. And this church passes. This is big, man. Okay, and to the church of Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. Truth is, it has truth for its base, its foundation. He that is true. How much truth do you get out there today? This Bible answers every logical and moral objection known to mankind. As soon as you go away from this Bible, cursed is the man. Cursed is mankind. Anybody who trusts in the man, God says. Jeremiah chapter 17, 5. You're cursed if you trust in man. He that hath the key of David that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. The key of David. Also in Isaiah chapter 22, 22, he'll put it right on your shoulder. There it is. Open the door to truth. Shut the door on lies. The truth is the great separating force between right and wrong, good and evil, and heaven and hell. And our Lord Jesus Christ there is there with a sword of truth at the portal to heaven. And you all, every one of us will meet your maker. And it will be soon. Think about the affairs of time, infinity back, infinity forward, in this short flesh age that James so eloquently calls a vapor of time. Moses calls us, we're like grass. Up one day, we're gone the next. Think about the affairs of time, infinity forward, infinity back, this little short flesh age. We're like trees. We're there and then we're gone. But you go somewhere when you die and you will meet your maker. You will die at the most inconvenient time. Fate will not negotiate no matter how big of a star you think you are. And Jesus Christ will be there at that portal. As the Bible says, we get escorted by the angels back to that portal and then you're either in or you're out. There's no in between. There's no greasy lawyers there. There's no tribunal you can call. There's no counsel. There's nothing. You're there. It's yay or nay. How refreshing is that? And the people on the yay side deserve it. The people on the nay side, we pray for you. We're not pointing fingers at you. We want all our children back. All of us, all your brothers and sisters, we want the whole human family back. But you can't come back to a place of peace beyond our presence of comprehension if you're still carrying a negative energy. Okay. I know that works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. That means a little strength, a small minority in the manuscripts, a small minority. What is this? He's talking about a small minority of people. You look for somebody with the truth. I went into the churches. Okay, there's just the last couple churches I joined, and then uh, both of them got kicked out because they wanted me to adhere to them actively, destroying the truth. And the church before that said, in Bible study, we don't want to hear the word Satan or beast, or whore. Well, if you guys think you're too good for the Bible, then it, it, Jesus Christ tells us all things. A loving Father will tell you who the enemy is so we can prepare for it. So when Jesus Christ comes, it's not going to be like a thief in the night for you. So those churches are just actively distorting the truth, trying to sugarcoat God's word. And believe me, in the church of, uh, not this one, Philadelphia passes, but the next church, of uh, Laodiceans, we learn about what God thinks about covering His Word, dirty covering. And if you want to read about that, Ezekiel chapter thirteen, God's outstretched arms. What's what's on His outstretched arm? The ministry of salvation, His righteous right arm, stretched out, and people will cover it, trying to sugarcoat God's word. Don't say Satan, Michael, and do not say whore, and do not say, um, yeah. Can you try to stay away from devil? Uh, and we don't want to hear you use the word sperm. And all these words in the Bible hundreds of times. Hundreds. That's the only way you can understand the parable of the terrors. Go back to the manuscripts. Jesus Christ is emphatically telling us. Anyways, let's stay on topic here. Behold, I will make them, them, of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. If you pull a racist thing out of here, and you're around me, you're gonna, you're gonna feel, you're, you're gonna be sorry. There's no room for racism in the Bible. Remember that um, Kenites can repent, and the Kenites ended up being the Rechabites, 
to nothing him. We followed this thread through the Bible all the way up. They got infiltrated the church. As we know, Psalms. It's not my day for memory today for some reason. Uh, Psalm 78. They worked their way right up in there. Worth the law is. That was Satan's first construct was to distort God's word and then set up a one world economy, one world political system, and one world education system. There's just four hidden dynasties that aren't hidden to us. We can see them. Jews. They say they are Jews. They're trying to say they're a brother Judah, but they're not. They're Jews, the adjective, which means of a people. It's a substantive grammatical term. It's used over 50 times in the New Testament. The word Jew is an adjective. It means having a separate and independent existence, following their own laws and rules as opposed to the laws and instruction provided by God. This, they're trying to say they are Jews of brother Judah. They're not. These are the Kenites. Right from, we just went over this thread. It took me four lessons to do it. Right from Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy in the Bible. God talking to Satan after he had a party with Eve and Adam in the garden. Always remember, direct reference to sexual organs in that garden. They were naked. They thought, and they were ashamed. What happened? Always remember, morals is the benchmark for human values and virtue. Get down to verse 15 here. And I will put, God talking to Satan, I'll put enmity, that's hostile hatred, between thee and the woman and between thy seed, you Satan, between your seed line that you just set up and her seed line. It shall bruise thy head, her seed line, our Lord. The truth. It's going to bruise his head. It's going to, we're going to destroy Satan by not acknowledging him. That's how you destroy him. By acknowledging the truth only. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Oh, he bruised Christ's heel, all right, on that cross. Don't you think otherwise? Head is a fatal wound. Heel's not a fatal wound. And all of us trying to get through this age, this flesh age, who's nipping at our heels? The serpent. Psh, Nikesh. That's what Nikesh says in, in, the, in the Hebrew language. The serpent means Nikesh. It's a descriptive term. The full sense meaning and full expression of that term means bright, shining one. It's an entity. It was Satan himself, Nikesh. That's a, that's a trait noun. It means a person who uses great words to put someone under a spell. The whole planet's almost spellbound right now. Nikesh. Created in the highest supernatural order. Created, created in the full pattern of beauty and wisdom. Ezekiel chapter 28. What did he do? What do you mean synagogue of Satan? He was in the synagogue. He was in the sanctuary. Ezekiel chapter 28 defiled. He defiled the sanctuary. Let's just go there for a minute. Ezekiel chapter 28. That's what Satan did. Defiled the sanctuary. Defiled means violated. The, it's kalal in the Hebrew. And it means violated the honor and integrity of God's ruling laws and sovereignty. That's what he did. Satan is one of the mayor from Genesis chapter 1, 14 to 19. One of the two unique light givers. That masculine noun for lights there is only used in the Bible. Of two unique light givers. Satan was in the sanctuary. He defiled it. His synagogue. His ideologies. His light. You can be as gods, he says, right in the first pages of the Bible. It's gods with a small g. means ruler or judge. Judge yourself. You ever hear people sitting there saying, I'm a good person, Michael, I'm a good person. You know what? 100% of those people that have said that have turned out to be cruddy people. Like, who are you trying to convince? You're judging yourself. This is the judge. The written word, the living word, Jesus Christ came in the volume of the book. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled amongst us. This is judge. You don't judge the very book you'll be judged by. Or criticize the very book you'll be criticized by. So Satan is saying, forget about God. You are your own God now. That's what Satan allows us. Go ahead. Free will choice. God will not violate the principles of free will. You cannot violate the principles principles of God without consequence. So what Satan's saying, Judge, you do what you want, you do what you want to do for your convenience. That's the light he started shining on shining out of the sanctuary, violating the honor and integrity of God's ruling laws and sovereignty. 
Okay, so that word in Genesis 1, 14 to 18, meor, the masculine noun, is only used of unique light givers. Yeah, I know this goes on. This goes on long. I, I could do this for eight hours solid. Easy. I could do this whole book. But uh, try to keep the video short. Behold, I'll make them a synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. That was the lead clergy of the day. That's Those are the ones that orchestrated Christ's death. They were constantly on him. Just constantly on Christ. To crucify him. Like the Roman soldiers only wanted peace. They just they just did what they had to do. We went over that extensively. And I hope you enjoyed the Kenites and and the definition of what Jew means in the Bible. We have Hebrews, Israelites, uh, Judah when it's a noun is a brother Judah, for example, way back in the book of Kings somewhere. Okay? Son of Judah, what the fourth son of Jacob, one of the twelve tribes of Israel. These people say they are Jews and are not, but they do lie. They're of the synagogue of Satan. And don't worry about it. They're causing all the trouble in the world. They're causing all the havoc, the distrust, the division, the pandemonium, all the gossip, the, the, the Satan's global media creates mob mentality through obsessive messaging for deception. It's a great falling away from the truth. That's called the great apostasy as written in the book of Thessalonians by Apostle Paul. Okay, it's already in works. It was already in works back then. Okay, I'll, uh, sorry, behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. What's this mean? You think you're going to be sitting there like King Poop on Turd Island, like you're a bag of chips, like you, you're all that in a bag of chips, and you have people worshiping at your feet? Give your head a shake, man. We pray for these people. What's he talking about? Jesus Christ talks about in uh, Lazarus and the rich man. What was, what was the rich man doing? Worship. He's begging like a dog. Give me a drink of water. Like a dog licking its master's hand. He was in the hell side. And we want to send people there to teach these people. Okay, you guys had a chance just like we did. Now here's another chance to come on back. You're my brother and sister. We love you. Now let go of these vain, corrupt, dark thought patterns. Because those are energies that you carry. Or you can't come back to a place of peace beyond our present comprehension and you're going to get blotted out. And in the meantime, you're just torturing yourself with your greeds, gluttonies, and egotisms and attitudes of obscene entitlement fueled by ruthless, unadulterated greed. You can't come over to the heaven side. Okay, that's what it means for worship at thy feet. Like, they're going to be wanting to know what's the truth. How do we get out of here? We know from uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 or 31... Okay, a lot of people go down to the pit with Satan himself from Isaiah chapter 14. And it says, And they shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. This word isn't comforted. This is what they're going to be worshipping. They're going to try to be getting out. But whomsoever will, who knows what's going to be in their attitudes. Comforted is in a calm in the Hebrew. It means the absolute opposite of comfort. It's a permanent root verb. This word is nakam lies within words that are ano. Matopoic, that means they sound like the word, like cow goes moo or gun goes bang. Okay, these words are imitations of the sound. And what's this mean? Nakam, it means to lament out loud in anguish, like the rich man was. Give me a drink of water. But he's still acting like he's all that. He's telling Abraham what he's still ordering people around. Abraham, send, uh, give, give, give me a drink of water. Send Lazarus to get me a drink of water. Abraham. Send Lazarus down there to appear in front of my brothers and sisters. He just can't. He just can't submit with an unquestioned obedience to the Lord God. He can't do it. Nether parts of the earth. That's the lowest part of the earth to describe hell throughout the Bible. There's no praise or presence of God there whatsoever. You don't want to end up there. But it's your free will choice. You write your own sentence in the here and now. Okay, so because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them which dwell upon the earth, which dwell upon the earth. This is, people think, oh, hour of temptation. I'm going to pull a mid-trib theory out of that, or a pre-trib. Okay, y'all, they're nice try. We stay to the end. Read Matthew chapter 24. We stay to the end. No one's getting plucked out of here. There's no such thing as a rapture. That's a brutal tradition that's worked its way into the church. And how flaky can you be? You want to be down here trying to fulfill the commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. We you think you're going to fly away? 
There's no rapture. There's no mid-trip. We're there to the end. If our uh, flesh body holds up. It's being said here. What, what about this? Yeah, but it'll keep me from the hour of temptation. That's because all the vain curiosities out there, the emptiness of the material world, and the utter meaninglessness and insincerity of the superficial world mean nothing to us. It's not tempting. I'm not tempted to go out there and get a get a big get a paycheck and go off to the car dealership or go to the mall or pay into rich man's rich white man's construct. What's my temptation now? I just want to serve the Lord and have a community here where we have a local food source. The way God set it up. The ecosystem feeds us, not chemical fertilizers and commodities. That's my temptation, to serve the Lord. Everything else. I can't wait till I don't have to drive anymore. I can't wait till there's people here to serve God, serve the Lord. You don't, you're not tempted. You're not tempted by any of the lusts or wants of the body anymore. It's gone and it's a freedom. I've walked it. Brutal lusts of the flesh. I've walked it. You're free now. It's not tempting to you. Now that it's not tempting to you, you can serve me. Because I'll open up this Bible for you like you've never believed would be open before. And it happened to me. Who am I? White trash high school dropout. And this book is just like, to teach this book, I have to know at least five times more than what I can possibly even articulate. And that's why I like to share it with people here. But uh, like I said, a rabbi once told me, he said, dude, you're, on, you're getting close. You got to let go of the rest of everything you're holding on to. And I did. And he says, you watch. You're going to end up being lonely at first. But hold on to your convictions. That's what Jesus Christ says. Because he says right here, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. Keep it. Guard it. That no man take thy crown. Crown here is Stephanos. It's something that encircles your head. Don't let anyone get in your head. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in my, in the temple of my God. That means you become part of the structural fabric of the key, uh, or, uh, of the kingdom of heaven itself. This energy. Think about your energy. Think. Okay, this is. Think about your mind. Okay, your spirit is an energy. There's no scientist on planet Earth that will ever be able to figure out how. You know what the brain looks like, how the mind emerges from that, glob of. Whatever's inside your head here, your brain, how the mind emerges from the brain to form a personality, a consciousness, a reactive attitude that motivates all actions. That is not metabolic. If science wants to call it physiological, we call it our spirit. It's our energy that goes somewhere. It's just stuck in this vessel right now because this is a time of correction. God's given us a free will choice. He will not violate the principles of free will. He only wants your free will love. That's what repent means. It's not grudgingly. It's free will done. Let's finish this up here. Church of Philadelphia passes with flying colors. Same with the Church of Smyrna. The only two that pass. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in my temple. In the temple of my God. You become part of the structural fabric of the kingdom of heaven itself. And some of you may have got a glimpse of... God allowed me once to get a glimpse of the structural fabric of the sky, an engineering feat that only a supernatural architect could have pulled off. Engineer, architect of the universe. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. The etymology of the word Jerusalem. A place of peace beyond our present comprehension, a place of safety, a place of completeness, a place of perpetual friendship and trust and love is waiting for you. No guile, no malice, no corruption can enter there. Jesus Christ will not accommodate it. He didn't die on that cross as some sideshow. That was the most selfless act of love and compassion beyond our present comprehension so he could make this valid and legit. Jesus Christ is the only one worthy because he's the only one that can say this. In John chapter, I forget. Satan, you got nothing on me. And that's what your goal is. Nothing's tempting to you anymore. It's not tempting. 
You live meek life. And that doesn't mean easily imposed upon. That doesn't mean submissive. Meek means strong in your convictions. You're strong. You can't budge. That's what meek in the Hebrew means. I know how to say no to myself in the face of all the vain curiosities. New Jerusalem, waiting for you, waiting for me. Pray for the whole human family, including those narcissist, psychopath billionaires that want to... It's just, it's just beyond my mind. It's, it, it's just beyond all reasonables, what they want to do. Like, why would you have these narcissist, sociopath billionaires making all the decisions on how the world's supposed to be for 8 billion people. Now we've identified the problem. Now you have to confront it and correct it. And Jesus Christ gives us a way out. He says, assemble yourselves, find a homesteading community, get involved and serve the Lord. That's what Jesus Christ expects. How far are you going to get in white man's construct anyway? Kicking against the pricks. That's all you're going to be doing. Even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. Ask I'm not allowed to say names anymore. I already got my warning. Ask the billionaires that meet o from there, that meet over here in Switzerland and over in Billaberg. And they're, they're, these billionaires who are, are have gone the way of Cain and the Kenites, they've gone the way. I'm not saying that they're uh, the, the posterity of Cain himself, but they are definitely uh, a substantive... Uh, there's definitely a Jew as an adjective. They have a separate and independent existence following their own laws and rules opposed to the laws and instructions provided by God, God's divine laws of providence. The guy's trying to change agriculture. Like I said, the ecosystem feeds us. Not commodities and chemical fertilizers. But they've made us a commodity, surplus and expendable. Jesus Christ gives us a way out. He says, listen, they're going to call you dissidents. It's right on their website. World Economic Forum has been reading that website for years. For years, saying, wow, these people are highly motivated, extremely intelligent, and they have warehouses full of money. Their plans are valid, they're legit. The total absence of humanity. And we're watching it play out. He tells us this. Wait till we get to Revelation chapter 6. It's the greatest thing. Okay, this is what God's promising us. He tells us what to do in the here and now. Assemble yourselves. Get involved in the Companion Chapel homesteading community. Be one of the first people out here. We already have one trailer. We have a van coming out. And yeah, we're going to work the land. We're going to obey the God's ecosystem. And have our own independent food source right here. Thank you very much. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us a way out. He says, listen, I'll write on you a new name. Yeah, you're going to get a new name. Don't worry about it. I'll write upon him my new name. Chosen one. And he said, uh, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Not what some guy with the backwards car, Hey, Michael, you got, you got your money for God? Or some guy wearing a dress. The Spirit. The Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, and strength. The Spirit of reverence, you revere it. And the Holy Spirit. God in totality. Well, I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Mike. This is the Companion Chapel. Please get involved today. Whatever whatever you can help me out with to keep me doing these uh, videos, the, the donations so far and the Walmart gift cards are awesome. Yeah, I was down to eating once a day. That's true. And I did freeze my butt off here for the last two years with no electricity. Your donations have allowed me to get electricity. Not me. It's for you because now I get to do this it's for the whole many-membered body. I try and do this as often as I can. And the only thing that stops me is trying to go put these videos through iMovie and then through YouTube. And then I just blindly upload them and hope for the best. If you have a God-given talent to market, manage, or whatever God-given talent you have, come and be part of the Companion Chapel Worldwide Ministry. This is a registered nonprofit ministry. Email me at companionchapel at gmail.com. And this place is located at number 338, side road 28-29, Paisley, Ontario, Canada, N. 0G2N0. Zero zero. I'll try and put it down below. It takes me forever. Like to do one video, I could sit here and teach the Bible all day. Easy. From start to finish, just over and over. It's just like now I have to manage the videos and manage everything else. And it's too much for one person. That's your call to action. Now get involved today. Whatever God given talent you have, God expects you to use it in the many member many membered body of Christ. I want to thank you very much for watching. Promote, like, share, whatever you can do to get God's word out there. 
I want to thank you very much for watching. Have yourself a great day, and bye for now.